But this is works in progress. They are not done yet. Uh, so be, do feel free to ask questions. Uh, do feel free to give your name and institution. Do feel free to be nice about your questions. Do feel free to uh, give some feedback. That is what the uh, presenters are here for. Um, also, uh, do absolutely visit the posters. Uh, all of the presentations should be presenting their posters in the poster session this evening. Um, and you can spend endless amounts of time grilling them there if need be. Uh, time control, again, because there's a lot of presentations shoved into a relatively short amount of time. Um, there's time control for the audience. Yellow card means the questioner needs to uh, hurry up. Uh, we're running out of time. Red card means that I might be asking the staff to cut off your microphone in just a couple seconds. So really do please finish up. Um, and so uh, with that in mind, uh, we're going to start off with the first. Uh, switch here. So we have uh, Ichi Zhu, is it? Shu, Ichi Shu from uh, Florida International University. He's going to be talking to us about uh, IBIS, Interpose Big Data I.O. Scheduler. And I'm told he is looking for an internship. So stop by the poster afterwards and uh, see if that all works out. Thanks, Joe. Good afternoon. I'm here to uh, present IBIS, the Interpose Big Data I.O. Scheduler. So one of the many forms of big data systems is a MapReduce system. The MapReduce framework divides a large job into many small tasks and executes them in parallel across multiple nodes. And in the back end, where large amounts of data needs to start is the distributed file system. For example, the HDFS for Hadoop or GFS for MapReduce from Google. And the specialty about distributed file system is that it distributes I.O. across many, many data nodes for replication and also parallel execution. And uh, another point is that these distributed I.O.s are highly coupled with the distributed tasks, such that the distributed tasks finally end up running on the same node where the, uh, the data locates. And when we zoom in into the distributed data nodes, we see a lot of I.O. activities going on for different multiple applications. Because in reality, the big data system is commonly shared between multiple applications. In the system, not only there are a lot of, uh, are there a lot of different applications, but each application has a number of different I.O. phases going on, and the I.O. demand in these phases are very different. And if you see clearly that uh, these different phases I.O. may finally hit the local file system, but they may go through different channels to achieve that. But in reality, the applications have, because the applications have different I.O. demands and applications I.O. will interfere with each, with each other. However, the, the native Hadoop or MapReduce system is not able to differentiate different applications, nor can the current system to uh, control the quality of service of different applications. And we propose IBIS, the Interposed Big Data I.O. Scheduler, which intercepts the I.O. activities between the map or reduce tasks and the lower end file system namely the distributed file system or the local file system. We hope to enforce the total service proportional sharing across the distributed storage. And we do this by using per application bandwidth allocation through the interposed scheduler. And we will apply the distributed scheduling by IBIS with low cost coordination. Because in this uh, distributed file system, not only should we respect the contention on each local node, but we also need to respect that there are contentions of a different extent on the higher job level. And in our ev initial evaluation, we uh, run a few experiments. You can see on the leftmost bar is the original case where we run a word count alone using half of the CPU resources. And the y-axis is the running time of word count, which is uh, below 
six, 600 seconds. And in the middle bar, we scale the CPU resources to elimin eliminate the contention from the CPU. And because the storage does not scale, so the increase in running time of 64.5% is purely from IO contention. While we, uh, we evenly split the CPU resources between the two applications, when we run Terragen against word count, we make sure that each job gets equal share of CPU resources by enabling a native job fail scheduler inside Hadoop. And on the rightmost bar, we tried to apply the proportional sharing algorithm on the I.O. side using SFQD and giving the two applications equal share of I.O. bandwidths. And as a result, we eliminated the increase in running time because we ensure that both applications get their fair share of I.O. resources. So this graph clearly shows that even if you can split evenly among CPU resources, it does not necessarily translate the performance of those two applications because they have uh, different I.O. needs. And the rightmost bar achieves around about 103% of the original runtime of word count. And conclusion is we have created a interposed I.O. scheduler upon HDFS, and we are able to isolate the performance interference from a highly I.O. intensive application and restore the uh, per performance of the affected application. And in the future, we hope to combine the intermediate I.O. scheduling with HDFS I.O. scheduling because, uh, as I mentioned before, there, there are multiple phases of I.O. for uh, each job, and during those different phases, they may go through different channels to perform I.O. activities. And the, and the th second future work is to integrate CPU scheduling, namely the job or task schedulers inside Hadoop, to achieve application-specific uh, quality of service by coordinating the I.O. scheduler with the task scheduler. And with that, I'm happy to take any questions you may have. Microphone is not on. There you go. Well, I have a question, certainly. Uh, have you considered maybe looking at also what uh, network contention could possibly be interfering with um, the runtime of tasks, since that's another resource which seems to be constrained in Hadoop systems? Uh, uh, your question is on whether to consider network contention? Correct, yes. Yes, we have that in mind, but I think uh, network contention is not as uh, serious as I.O. contention because uh, Ideally, most of the task will be executed in a data local style. So uh, we are assuming that network resource is more abundant than I.O. resources. Thank you. Is there time for another question? There's absolutely time for another question. Hi, Harumi Kuno, HP Labs. I was wondering on uh, two things. On slide five. Okay. So why? Uh, what was the difference between the bar on the right and the middle one? Both of them are two concurrent apps that are yes. using all the CPUs. So yeah. why is the one on the right more efficient? Yes, um, on the middle bar, there are no quality of service control. So the two applications simply contend with each other. And IO contention caused the runtime of word count to increase a lot. And on the rightmost bar, uh, you can see from the description of the x-axis, we applied a, a proportional sharing algorithm to protect each application from interfering with each other. So you, you are limiting the number of concurrent streams or something? Pardon me? How are you uh, imposing fairness? I think, I think uh, that we could take this offline. Yeah. Thank you very much for your question. Thank you. Uh, again, we'll be at the poster. So the uh, next talk is going to be by uh, Peter Varnon from Rice University. And uh, unfortunately, the student couldn't be here. Uh, so Peter's going to begin again. It's about adaptive resource allocation and tiered storage systems. So yeah, thank you. OK, so as mentioned, uh, uh, this is work by uh, Hui Wang, who's uh, a PhD thesis, this is, but she's not been uh, uh, over here. OK, so the issue that we're going to address is the trade-off between system utilization and fairness in a tiered storage system. 
Yes, we have a very uh, uh, generic model of the storage system. Two types of devices, say SSDs and HDs, uh, and hard disks with different speeds. They are shared by a number of clients with different QoS requirements. So what makes this problem interesting is that we have two types of devices which use the same common currency of IOPS to measure their performance for QoS purposes. On the other hand, we know in reality both the devices have very different access costs and different uh, throughput capabilities. Okay, so I'm going to use a couple of examples to sort of show, show the problem and our approach. Uh, so in this example, we have two clients uh, with equal shares, which means that we would like to allocate equal number of IOs to the two clients. Uh, and the FS is the fair scheduler, which is going to do that uh, allocation. Now at runtime, they may have different hit ratios. So client A is shown here with having a hit ratio of half, client B with a hit ratio of one, meaning that all its accesses are to the SSD. So when the scheduler uh, schedules these uh, IOs, you'll get a profile idealized looking like this. Essentially, we force them to get an equal number of IOs. So over here, they would get 400 IOs per second each. Uh, and, but if you look at the utilizations, the disk is 100% utilized, but the SSD is only 60% utilized, mainly because uh, one of the IOs of the red client is much more expensive than the two, uh, blue, uh, two IOs of the blue client. So the natural question is, can we increase the system utilization? What's the issue over there? So for this example, it's clear that it's very easy to do so. Uh, essentially, we take all the white slots in the top schedule and put in blue IOs over there, and we can fill up all the remaining slots. So yes, we get 100% uh, utilization of the both devices, and client A gets 400 IOPS, and client B now goes from 400 to 800 IOPS. So we are going, the system utilization has increased from 800 to 1200, and client A has not faced any difficulty. It had 400, it's still getting 400. Client B has absorbed all the uh, available IOPS. Okay, so this is a win-win, a good situation. And uh, essentially, uh, point one of our uh, approach is therefore we are going to adaptively change the weights uh, as, uh, as, the, uh, as, as things proceed to increase the utilizations of the clients. Okay, here's another example where uh, the hit ratios, uh, the setup is the same, but the hit ratio of one client is point one and the other one is point nine. So when we do the allocations over here, again, because it's a one is to one ratio, uh, by default they will get an equal number, 200 IOPS is what they will get, but the SSD will be at a very low utilization of 20%. So the question is, can we play the same uh, trick and try and increase the IO utilization? And it turns out that if you change the ratio to 1 is to 11, that's a typo, you can get 100% uh, utilization uh, in this case as well. However, when you look at it now and you say what are the allocations, uh, it's been heavily skewed in the ratios now 1 is to 11. So client B gets 1,100 IOPS. That's fantastic. From 200, it went up to 1,100. But client A now has suffered and gone from 200 down to 100. And this is a fundamental problem, nothing to do with how we schedule, but just based on the fact of, on the, of the numbers, what is the relative speed of the two devices, and what are the hit ratios of the, of the clients which are concurrently accessing it. Right, so uh, we cannot uh, sort of, this is the trade-off, therefore, between the utilization and the fairness. There can be many ways to try and address it. The particular approach we take over here is to prevent any client from going too low by putting a lower bound or a minimum reservation that it would uh, be guaranteed, even uh, as we play with the allocations to increase system utilization. Okay, so I'll just give the very, very high level idea of the approach. You can talk more during the uh, posters, people are interested. So the approach is basically to dynamically monitor the hit ratio of the clients, and periodically the allocation algorithm will kick in, maybe on demand, uh, to uh, reallocate uh, resources based on the hit ratio. And essentially it runs some sort of an optimization algorithm where it maximizes the system throughput subject to the reservations, perhaps limits if you put them, and of course the available system capacity. Between allocation uh, intervals, we, we have no guarantee of what's going to happen. If the miss ratio falls, we have a scheduler which takes care of this issue by uh, a scheduler like the M clock uh, presented earlier on uh, uh, to, to make sure that we get uh, allocations proportional to the weight but never allow anybody to fall below their uh, allocation. Essentially, the, the trade-off is that during the periods of reallocation, the utilization may go down depending upon uh, what the hit ratios are, but never below the reservations. Okay, so we'll go over this uh, later on, I won't go into it, but essentially what we show over here on the left-hand side, before the, uh, we have the clients utilizing fully because we assign them weights to get 100% utilization, uh, and if the miss ratio changes, the, the allocations fall as shown by the fall. However, at the reallocation interval, uh, time at time 500, we can push them back up again. Okay, I'm going to pretty much stop over there. It's a work in progress. There are a number of issues over there which probably better discussed uh, during the poster session. Yeah, thank you.
No. <laughs> okay then. Peter, thank you. Do please come up to ask questions and, and, and stand up, in fact, and get in line before the talk is over. Uh, we, we'd love, I think, everybody to get feedback. Um, so anyway, our third speaker today is Dolceto Ortega, uh, also from Florida Illinois University. Apparently, everybody from the south of the country got to go first today. Uh, so uh, actually, you had a PowerPoint as well, I thought. Well, you get. All right, well, anyway, trace analysis for block level caching cloud computing systems. I personally love trace analysis, so I'm really looking forward to hearing uh, what we're going to find out, and I look forward to hearing all of your uh, feedback. So thank you very much. Thank you, Joe. Uh, good afternoon. I'm here to present a trace analysis on block level caching for cloud computing system. This is a collaboration work between Florida International University and Cloud BPS. This is a cloud provider uh, in Europe. So. As a background, we know that closed system traditional use network storage in order to store the ease of virtual machines. And uh, multiple hosts holding multiple virtual machines are the same network storage in order to uh, provide virtual machine migration and, uh, and other features that this allows. So when the number of virtual machines increase between the hosts and the number of hosts sharing the same network storage increase, there is a bottleneck in the network storage. So we uh, had developed a, previ a previous work. We uh, created a cache for the uh, host side. Um, using benchmark, we have proved that this uh, uh, SSD cache in, uh, in the host size can increase the performance of the I.O. So now we want to uh, study traces in order to uh, study different mechanisms and policies in order to make an efficient use of SSD caching for the closed systems. So the overall objective of this trace analysis is answers these key questions. So first, if the cloud computing is a good target for SSD caching, and what is the, the size of the cache that this world loss requires during the, and if this world loss change during the time. So determine the best cache size for this world loss. Another question is which right policy will be fit better for different world loss. It will be right back, it will be given as the highest heat ratio or if we take care more of the consistency, which one is, it will be suitable. Another question is when we are uh, providing cash for diverse workload, how to allocate these workloads in order to make the best efficient use of this cash. Uh, our traces were collected uh, in two different locations. The first one, uh, we collect uh, traces at our university during months. We trace uh, servers like web server, file server, Moodle servers. And also, we take traces for our collaborators, so Cloud VPS. We, those are traces day long. We trace um, around 170 virtual machines that are in production. Uh, those workloads are diverse because the, the virtual machines are for different purposes. Um, so after we have the traces, we start an analysis doing a real replace of the traces in an environment similar to the one, the one that were collected. And also, we uh, develop a simulator in order to uh, accurately get the heat ratio and all the characteristics of the world loss. So the results, first of all, we get the I.O. patterns. Uh, we want to determine if the world loss is read or write intensive and how this change during the time. So we evaluate, for example, our uh, FIU web server is results that is a write intensive and all the time during the three months that we evaluated is a write intensive. Uh, the, se the opposite happened for a file server that we have in FIU. And this is an example for the uh, Moodle server, and the one below is from uh, a set of uh, virtual machines. So the heat ratio, the read ratio changed uh, from virtual machine from one to another. So we only show the average that is at, at the end is a, a result that is 62% of writes. That's the average of all the virtual machines, so, but in, in, in specifically it's different. Um, then we evaluate the cache policies. We evaluate a write back uh, policy and write through with allocation and write through without allocation. And write back it presents the highest heat ratio uh, because it, 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 it saves all of them. But for write intensive uh, uh, workloads, it results that write back is a way better than the other two. But in uh, workloads that the reads are considerable high, it's very close. And we can see the same thing with the Moodle web server and the Cloud VPS virtual machines. So the heat ratio varies. So 
Once the heat ratio is not only the thing that determines that some cash or write policy is better than the other, so we evaluate the IO latency of these workloads too. We replay it and we take the IO latency using cash, using cash with write through and write back. Uh, we have some preliminary results. So we see that the write back is still getting better, uh, the lower latency than the other two. Um, so we're still working on this. As a conclusion, we can see that the SSD caching is important for closed storage, and the write back policy is the one that presents the highest heat ratio. But we're also uh, aware that the other policies are good too. So for future work, we want to determine like how, how to determine to allocate different workloads in using the same cache and how to improve the durability of write cache data. With that, uh, I will take questions for anyone. Hi, Tom Telfey, Microsoft. Um, I, I'm surprised you didn't uh, look to the, whether the workload was sequential, random, large, small. When you um, say SSD, what, what's critical about an SSD with, with, without analyzing that data as well? Oh, I didn't show here the sequential analysis, but we, we have doing some sequentiality analysis, and also we check the working set size of these traces. So we can discuss all of that in the, in the poster. I have some data for that too, but Good, like it's you. some five minutes, so thank you. So actually I have a question, uh, I can use my prerogative. When sure. are the traces gonna be available? Are you gonna release the traces? <laughs> sure. Well, when? Uh, we can talk uh, to do some collaboration, I don't know. We can talk offline for that. Okay, any other questions? All right then, well thank you very much. Very sorry for being the uh, time beat person, but uh, we do have to move. And uh, our next presenter is uh, Leng Xiao Tzu. Am I saying that right? I'm very sorry. It's Yang Hong Tzu. Xu. I really should be uh, better at this by now. So anyway, uh, Yang Hong is uh, from Carnegie Mellon. He's gonna talk to us about Jackrabbit, uh, which is uh, elasticity, uh, agility in elastic distributed storage. Not, not elasticity and agile storage, that doesn't make any sense whatsoever. So thank you very much. All right, Come on. thank you, Joe. Hello, uh, everyone. Today I'm gonna talk about Jackrabbit, improved agility in elastic distributed storage. So this is a joint work of Carnegie Mellon and Intel Labs. So distributed storage systems can and should be elastic, just like elastic cloud computing. For multi-purpose storage devices or servers, elasticity is useful for allowing the freedom of a cloud infrastructure to schedule the uh, associated other resources for other purposes. For single-purpose storage device or servers, elasticity is beneficial to reduce the energy usage. So just a direct translation of how much money you can save by the reduction of energy consumption or the machinery usage you can, uh, you can probably get a sense of why elasticity is great. But unfortunately, nowadays, most distributed storage systems are not elastic. The primary reason for this is just that they are not designed for elasticity, but rather for load balancing. For example, the well-known Google file system and Hadoop distributed file system. And this files, in these file systems, they use a pseudo-random data placement so that you will have very good performance due to good load balancing. However, if performance goes down and you want to shrink the system size, for example, to half of the original size, you just can't do that because you will lose data availability when removing servers for performance reasons. So elasticity is good and there are already some several elastic storage system designs out there. I'm not gonna talk about all of that Today I'm just gonna focus on uh, one design which, which was the um, Rabbit uh, Elastic Storage System that was uh, originally developed at Carnegie Mellon. So in the Rabbit system, uh, I'm, I'm now showing you the graph of the data layout of the Rabbit system. So in Rabbit, we, um, we sequentially numbered the servers in a cluster and the x-axis 
shows you, the, uh, show, uh, represents a server number. For example, if you have 100 servers in your cluster, then the server number would be numbered from one to 100. And the y-axis represents the data stored on each of these servers. So in Rabbit, the idea to, to preserve data availability when shrinking system size is to use a primary set to store the first replica of all data. So essentially, when you write every data block, the first replica always goes to, the, uh, always goes to a small number of servers, which is, uh, which is we call them primary uh, servers. And that is marked as the red region on the graph. And the non-primary replicas, for example, the secondary and tertiary replicas, are then written on the, uh, the non-primary servers. So um, you, you see that um, I have explained the uh, primary servers, but you see a curve like that showing, uh, on the right side. That is because Rabbit was trying to achieve the power proportion uh, proportionality property. By power proportionality, uh, I mean for any active, for any active num uh, I mean the read performance of the system is proportional to the number of active servers at that time. So to, to achieve this pro uh, property, Rabbit has to make sure that for any number of active servers, the amount of read workload that it has to, uh, it will contribute to is uh, are equal across all these servers. And that is the equal work data layout. So we can talk more, more details about this equal work data layout at the poster session, but it, this is the uh, data layout used in Rabbit. Um, however, there's a problem in Rabbit, as you can see here, that do, uh, when there are for write-heavy workloads, these primary servers get much more writes than non-primary servers, and as a result, they become a, a performance bottleneck, and we call this problem the write performance degradation problem. So in order to solve this performance problem, Rabbit borrows idea from the average storage system, which essentially provides a technique called write offloading, and specifically, for writes that goes to the uh, primary servers, they are now uh, offloaded to the relatively lightly uh, loaded servers. Essentially, is a higher number of servers on the right hand. And you can see a um, data layout like this. Um, and of course, as a consequence of offloading, those primary copies that were originally constrained in the primary set are now spread across all the active servers. And, and consequently, now whenever you want to decrease the uh, active number of servers, uh, you, will have to, you will have to migrate some, some number of blocks to preserve the data availability uh, because the, uh, these deactivated servers would contain some primary copy. And as a result, it results in a poor agility of the system. By agility, I mean the quickness of elastic resizing. So to solve this uh, dilemma of, of, um, of Rabbit, we propose Jackrabbit, which, uh, which essentially proposes several new offloading and migration policies to improve system agility while accommodating performance goals. So this is original Rabbit data layout with uh, average style offloading. And the key idea of Jackrabbit is that instead of offloading writes to all the active servers. We constrain the set of servers that will receive offloaded writes. And you can see that, and we call this set, uh, we call this set of servers the offload set, which is larger than the primary set. And by constraining the offloaded writes to the uh, relatively small number of offloaded set, now you can shrink the system size down until the offload set without any, without uh, doing any cleanup work and this significantly improves system agility. And by the way, uh, uh, by the way, JackRabbit also uh, achieves a performance that is comparable to your uh, Rabbit, uh, Rabbit system with offload, uh, average style offloading. And we call this technique write offloading. And in fact, we do develop several other techniques, for example, read offloading and passive migration. So these techniques these techniques combined together to significantly reduce the data migration work that we need to do. 
and as a result, it provides improved agility for the system. So now I'm going to give part of the evaluation uh, of our system because of the time uh, limitation. So we evaluate our systems using real-world traces from six industry uh, Hadoop deployments, one from Facebook and five from Cloudera customers. So this graph shows you the data migration that will be needed for the original Rapid system with average style of loading and the Jackrabbit system. The x-axis shows, uh, represents six traces that we do analysis on. The y-axis shows you the normalized result to the data migration uh, of Rapid system. So lower is better. The red line, uh, the red bar shows you the um, result for Rabbit, and the green line shows the uh, result for Jackrabbit. And you can see that Jackrabbit significantly reduced the data migration overhead you will need by a factor of up to two, or, uh, two orders of magnitude. And that will result in a 6 to 120 percent improvement in machine hour usage of the system. I will conclude my talk here, and I'm glad to um, talk, um, answer your questions. Akshat Aranya, NEC Labs. Uh, how is Jackrabbit different from just using a larger set in Rabbit? Like in just using a larger set of primary servers? Uh, can you, sorry. You can how speak? is Jackrabbit different than just using more machines as your primary set for Rabbit? Uh, yes, so that's a good question. So essentially, in, uh, I'm only showing you the primary set, but actually we also have secondary and tertiary replicas. If you increase the uh, primary set in Rabbit, then actually the placement of secondary and tertiary uh, servers, uh, uh, replicas will also change accordingly. And you will need more servers to, uh, to, you will need to increase the total size of your cluster. But in the Jackrabbit. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. <laughs> All right, we can take this offline. Take it offline, thank you very much. So while uh, we're doing the uh, little switcheroo here, uh, we're done with that. So anyway, our uh, next speaker is uh, Dimitros, oh goodness, Skirtis yeah. uh, from UCSC. Uh, so, uh, and uh, I apparently have forgotten what it is we're expecting to be uh, hearing about. I left that uh, cheat sheet somewhere else. Um, So solid state drives are perfect. Um, they have low latency, they have high throughput, they have consistent performance, the capacity is going up, and now, while all that is happening, the cost is lowering. So it sounds really good. So, and indeed, that's the case. If you give me a clean drive for certain workloads, you're going to get that kind of performance. But as long as you start doing writes over, over larger parts of the drive, your throughput will go down, your latency is going to go up, and you're not going to have consistent performance. And that, to a large degree, is because of the garbage collection that is happening in the background, uh, which leads to internal fragmentation. So if you'd like to visualize, it, visualize this in a different way, you can think of your SSD as this green ball on the left, and after, after you do writes, it becomes like the thing on the right. But reads alone are great. Um, the problem is that you mix them with writes, and then reads uh, also become uh, inconsistent. Uh, the latency becomes really uh, large, like over 100 milliseconds. And the throughput may or may not drop. So solid state drives are not perfect. So our, clear motivation, our motivation is clear. Many applications require low latency, high throughput, performance consistency. And some might require QoS and high performance guarantees. Moreover, SSDs are, are increasingly used as large caches or permanent storage, and that's because they have faster random access than uh, hard drives. So how do we achieve high performance? Should we use heuristics, like should we prioritize reads, 
as long as the drive gets blocked, even if we prioritize reads, they, they're going to have to wait for 100 milliseconds or more. Should we use heuristics? So SSDs behave differ differently. So one heuristic may work well on a drive, but not well on another. And we have examples of that. So we propose one approach for all. We propose to physically separate reads from writes. We have two drives instead of one. One is going to be doing only reads at any given point in time. And at the same point in time, the other drive is going to be doing writes. Now, on top of that, we place a cache. So writes go to the cache. And the writes that end up in the drive come from the previous period. So every sometime, the drive switches roles. The one that was doing reads now is doing writes. And it's doing the writes that the other drive did in the previous period. So in other words, it syncs up. So some properties of that is that um, the read performance is going to be equal to the throughput of a dedicated uh, drive, while the write throughput is going to be equal to that of half a dedicated drive. Some more properties. A read always has access to the latest data, possibly through the cache. And the union of the cache with any drive at any given point in time contains all the data. So you have fault tolerance. Some bonuses is that uh, you may optimize reads and writes separately. It's easier to provide high performance guarantees. And you may use cheaper SSDs because uh, you separate reads from writes physically, so you don't need to have a good SSD. So some evaluation. On the left-hand side, you see that the graph that I showed you before, which is using just one drive. So the reads are all over from 100 to 450 IOPS. On the right-hand side, I'd like to focus on the reads and see that it's a straight line. So we basically get a latency that is constant. The writes are twice because we write, uh, the throughput is twice because uh, we write uh, each write, we, do, we perform it in both drives. But from the perspective of the user, uh, it's the same as before, more or less. So the same thing you can do for small requests. The reads are going to be stable, and the writes are going to be doing whatever they do anyway. Uh, so the current work, we are evaluating this on top of live workloads like databases and virtual machines, and we're completing our QA support. We like to combine this with uh, RAID 10, like uh, as you can see in the diagram, and RAID 01, because you already have uh, uh, twice the amount of drives, so it's a good um, scenario. Another idea is to uh, have on-demand assignment of the second drive, because sometimes you don't really have a problem with your SSD, so why have twice the SSDs on your uh, storage? And for future, we would like to, uh, if it all goes well, we would like to have a kernel implementation and turn this SSD pair into a single SSD with uh, a QoS inside the SSD and, and an API to, uh, to control that. So into a single piece of, hard, of hardware. Conclusion, uh, SSDs offer underperformed due to writes. And by adding a second drive and a cache, according to um, our uh, scheduling, our solution, leads to high performance, low latency, and performance consistency. Thank you. Hi, uh, Tom Lyon here. Um, is it possible to generalize this to have n plus one drives, where you're just writing on one drive and all the rest are reads? So, so like, um, like this, you mean? Sorry, you, you mean you you may you are saying can can you generalize this to have more than two drives instead of just two drives? Say you have three drives. Can yeah. you do the same kind of mechanism, writing only to one of the three drives at a time? Yeah, so that would be something like RAID 01, which is at the bottom, right? Um, so on the left, we have three read, read uh, drives. On the right, we have three write drives. Right, but that's still equal numbers. I'm wondering if it could be two and one, that kind of thing. Yeah, it's, it's uh, for discussion, I think. Uh, what happens when you crash and you've written to one drive and not the other? If one drive crashes? No. The system crashes after you've written to one drive before you've written to the other one. How do you fix it? So if your system crashes and it's in one drive, 
Um, that's safe. It's in one drive. So. Well, but it's not in the other one, and you got to put it there before you use it. So. Wait. Um, so it goes <laughs> to one drive, right? And then your system crashes. Yep. Then the problem is what? Okay, I didn't see that. I think that's something you talk about at the poster. Yeah. So. All right. So uh, thank you again. Um, so our uh, next up is going to be uh, James Hughes from Huawei. Now, uh, set up port multipliers considered harmful. We don't usually do the considered harmful anymore, but um, I actually know from personal experience that they can be a little bit tricky. Uh, and so hopefully you will uh, have interesting questions and stop by the poster. Okay. Hi. This is uh, the, the uh, Peng Li. Uh, was not able to make it. He was the intern that worked uh, with me and John Plocker at, uh, at Huawei last summer. Uh, basically, SATA port multiplexers allow you to have a single controller, and with a single controller, you can have more drives. Uh, there are, are blogs out there about people building cloud data centers that are, make extensive use of, of, of port multiplexers. Uh, there has been little work, as far as we could tell, studying the reliability of SATA port multiplexers, whether they make things better or worse. And to start doing that, we had to create reproducible and realistic failures for hard drives. We tried, is that moving? Yeah, we, oh, something's wrong, but that's okay. We tried to create failures by dropping the drive, but the failure was too quick. We tried to create failures by unplugging the drive, but the failure was too quick. So finally, we, we uh, decided to end up with a failure mode where we would take the top lid off the drive and watch the drive literally sitting on the table operating. And then while it operated for a period of about 10 to 15 minutes, it would be normal and then it would start failing. And then it would, then as it would fail, we could actually see the performance uh, of the failures. And where are we? Ah, we're taking the lid off. Um, and, and basically the goal was with multiple disks on the same system, would the other disk be impacted by one disk failing? That was the main question. And is it better to have two disks on a, a single controller or one disk um, and taking the top off? This was on a live drive while we were actually seeking. You can see the arms moving. OK? Thank you. Uh, it, it was fun. Uh, we did this experiment. It really was. Uh, we did this experiment approximately 40 times. OK? We destroyed 40 disk drives. Um, they were both Western Digital and Seagate, and they were both consumer and enterprise, and the results were consistent uh, between the drive vendors. The picture of one situation was where we had one drive per controller and a single CPU, two different IO meters running, one to each drive, independent processes. And the results were as expected when we had one drive per controller. Um, the, the I.O. rate would be constant. When we took off the lid on one drive, we would perturb it, and its performance would drop and then come back up while the lid was off. And then after a period of time, then the first drive would fail. The second drive would actually increase performance and then continue working until it reached the end of job. That was the expected failure mode. The next test was to actually put a port, SATA port multiplexer between the controller and the, uh, the drive. So now we have our test drive and our, 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 the drive we're going to fail and the drive we're not going to fail on the same controller. And uh, in this case, we got a very different, different result. In, in, again, this is reproducible. This is just one of the diagrams. We had many, many diagrams, of course. Uh, when the drive was, uh, lid was taken off, the perturbing of one drive also perturbed the other. You notice the blue line behind the red line also glitches at that time. And then when the, when the failing drive, the red drive fails, you, you see immediately that the blue drive starts having problems. We believe this is because Linux is resetting the controller or resetting the drive, and that this is causing problems with the other drive on the same controller, on the same port multiplexer. And at the end, all the way to the right, other than it was really bad performance for a while, the job actually fails and does not complete. So it is, it is a situation where, where one drive failed and the other drive also failed. So the results were that we were able to create a fun and, and realistic method for reproducible failures uh, in disk drives just by sim simply taking off the top. We, 
we, dem we played with whether or not a smoker came into the room or whether, you know, so on and so forth. Uh, that was kind of fun. But we also demonstrated the more serious result that with no SATA port multiplexers, the failure of one drive on a Linux system did not affect the other drive, which was a good, a good result, and the failure. And the second was with a SATA port multiplexer, um, every single time when one drive failed, the other drive failed. So the future work is more experiments, obviously. Explain why this happens. We don't have a clue, okay? We don't know. We don't know why. That's why it's a work in process session. And can it be solved? And I even have a question of whether a SATA port multiplexer is a standard, is, is something that is actually supported by the industry. So um, that's it. Mohammed Khatib, uh, NAC Labs. So I have a question. Would it be possible to reproduce such failures with uh, tampering with the connections instead of like damaging the disk permanently? Uh, okay. Reproduce it again with? Playing with the connector itself. For example, you put the switch on the connector, the SATA connector, and while the, the disk is working, just switch it off one of the pins. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And then instead of like killing the whole disk. Oh, shutting off one of the pins, simulating a pin failure. Right. Hmm. It, it could be possible. Um, um, uh, it could be. Um, but, yeah, but you'll get parity errors, and that's it. Then you're done. It certainly would not be as much fun as opening the top. No. Actually, Jim, I was going to suggest an even more fun way to kill the drive. Put a bullet through it. Say what? Put a bullet through the drive. Oh, we've done that. Yeah, I, I know. We, that's why done. I suggested it. <laughs> Oh, that was certainly entertaining. Uh, so our next speaker is a, a double header. Uh, so we have Yuri Schindler from NetAct, and uh, he's going to be first talking about RAID 6 equations and then about, I forget exactly which. So anyway, and we have slides, so we'll let him talk. Thank you. So the previous talk was about how do you actually fail drives. Well, this talk is about how do, you, how do we actually make them more reliable by doing RAID or double parity, stuff like that. So really what we set out with this work is to come up with a closed form reliability equation for double parity or RAID 6. A lot of heavy terms, so I will tell you what those mean in succession. And this is really a joint work with uh, John Elrod, who is the reliability expert, and um, me at um, so NetApp. So let me start uh, this talk by actually losing half the audience uh, here with this equation. Basically what we set out to do is we were in, in search of replacing the reliability equation that has been formulated back in the 1990s that's uh, called MTGDL or mean time GDL loss. It's, it was a very simple, nice model in the early 1990s, but many people pointed out, including Kevin Green and his colleagues, that really that equation doesn't accurately reflect the reliability profiles of drives in 2010 and the repair processes. So the reason for that is basically simple. Um, it's because the equation assumed Markov, Markov chains or distributions that, exponential distributions that lead to constant failure rates. And we all know that that's not really what happens in real life. Distributions are messy, things are not constant failure rates with time. So as a result, when you use this equation to plug in data for double parity rate, like even odd or rate EP that we use, or rate six, it's really inaccurate. And I will show you what that means by that. So what, you may wonder, what does accuracy matter? Well, our customers kind of care about data. They care even more about data losses. Uh, a difference between a single data loss or five data losses in a year kind of matters to them a lot. So we have customers, they have millions of drives in data centers, and so we kind of want to predict what's going to happen. And we are in the business of building systems out of sometimes unreliable disk drives, so we really want to understand how to design our systems. How do we overcome the unreliable disk drives, and not even unscrewing them and watching them die, but rather, how do we make the um, trade-off between reconstruction rates and failure rates um, so that uh, we maintain the efficiency of RAID 6, but at the same time, we are aggressive enough to repair potential errors such as uh, whole drive failures or latent media defects. So our model, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna lose you uh, with showing equation what the model is, but basically it's a closed form equation that expresses failures or expected data loss as the number of data losses over time. What that means is that basically um, it looks at how many data losses can you have in your population of drives or rate groups in the data center? And it's more detailed than the MTD equation. We model media defects. We consider things like uh, the speed of media scrubbing. And most importantly, the parameters for this equation are derived from extensive field data studies. So we have 
tens of thousands of systems in the field. We have hundreds of thousands of disk drives, and all of them sort of sh uh, ship data back in here. So we analyzed the data, and based that analysis, uh, we formulated the uh, parameters for the different distributions. And it's accurate because unlike the Markov chain exponential constant failure rate distributions, we use general time-dependent distributions. And it turns out that the equation seems to match uh, pretty well what you know, we can expect from a time-consuming Markov chain simulations or what we have seen in the field. People do occasionally lose data. Um, so I'm not going to bore you with, with details, but basically the, the gist of the general distribution that's time dependent is something that's called in the reliability th uh, community a viable distribution, so that's on the left. And we all know that in the real world, data is messy. So here's a distribution of repair times for a gigabyte drive. So you see the bars, it's all over the place, right? And so the viable distribution has nice properties that if you set the parameters of the beta and new uh, coefficients, you can kind of fit pretty closely what's going on in the real world. So by doing that, by fitting it to what we observe in the field, we can actually model pretty accurately what's going on. And that's where we get the accuracy from. And so actually, we, this is work in progress, so what we really want to do is we want to crowdsource the research. So what we did is we actually put together the equation that I formulated that you will see on the poster if you come by, and uh, it's available for everyone to use, so let me kind of quickly show you what it does. Um, so it, it's a calculator that basically calculates in the background in JavaScript what, you, what the equation is about. You can use spreadsheet because it's pretty simple. And uh, let's sort of plug in some numbers. So we have pretty fine values for things like uh, reliable or fiber channel enterprise class disk drive. We also have pretty fine values for what we call unreliable one, one terabyte SATA drive. And every once in a while, you know, you get different disk drives, different models, different vendors uh, that um, sort of are sort of unlucky, or it's the rotten egg, if you will, right? So what happens if he's, it'll plug in some modest numbers? So let's put in here, say, uh, 25,000 raid groups for a modest enterprise. And that's about 400,000 disk drives. And that's not really that big of a deal, actually, as it turns out. And so um, you know, it's pre-configured with all kinds of values. But let's sort of plot what happens uh, to expect a number of failures over time. So on this, axis, on, on this graph, you see on the x-axis time, so we look at uh, mission time or time in service between zero and 10 years. And on the y-axis, we plot the number of expected data losses or triple disk failures over time. And the yellow line is actually what we compute from our work in progress equation. Um, and you see that's, it's sort of pretty bad, right? You can, you know, over five years, you get something like six or seven failures. Um, but if you compare that with the MTTDL equation, which is the blue line that you don't really see because it's the same thing as on the, on the x-axis, you kind of had to get a false sense of complacency because the equation predicts you know, nothing really happens. Everything is reliable and good. Well, we all know that's not the case. So again, um, you know, this is available. Please go out, try it out, give us comments. And you know, this is, I think, one of the first attempts to crowdsource research to the community. Thank you. Um, your, your research seems to focus on, on uh, hardware and failures, and um, there's always firmware, but what about wetware? What about whichware? <laughs> <laughs> the human factor. You know, in 10 years, you have a storage system with a lot of failures and a lot of service people coming in, and, and you have a lot of problems where people make mistakes, and your research yeah. doesn't cover that. Well, actually, it does, because you know, we, we don't have visibility to exactly what person in what, what company or customer did what, but it's covered in there, right? So if there was someone pulling the, pulling the, the drive prematurely getting the wrong one, well, first of all, it's fine because typically it's the one drive that fails, so they were carried. Second, it would be in the data that we analyze. So in some sense, I would claim that the distributions and the profiles we get also cover the human errors, although whether they were any or whether customers that use our systems are actually conscious, I don't know, but it's, it's in the data. Okay, yeah. thank you. Okay, then let's introduce our next speaker. Um, <laughs> yay, thank you. All right, and here you go again. Thank you. So I have to have a Ruby a moment for a sec. Okay, thank you. So th this is a different kind of work. This is much earlier stages than the previous one. And really with this work, what we set up to do is um, do some trace analysis. I'm sure Joe would be happy about that. Um, and looking what happens in a virtualized data center that uses large host side or flash based caches. 
And really, this is work uh, by Jinxin Feng. I'm kind of just helping out. Unfortunately, she wasn't able to come too fast, but uh, I want to present her work for her, so this is really all her work. So just to refresh what we're talking about, um, a, this is a typical cartoonish way of representing how a virtualized data center looks like. We have a, um, at the bottom a, a shared um, storage system such as a clustered ONTAP that we sell and that provides storage for um, a collection of servers that uh, run hypervisors. So in this example we have three hypervisors uh, and they all in turn run uh, a large number of virtual machines um, that have their own application and, uh, and uh, OS stacks. And inside each of those hypervisors, what is pretty common these days, people actually put some amount of flash memory. We know that's inexpensive enough, and typically what that is there for is for using that capacity that's in that flash memory as a read cache. And typically we're talking about a terabyte of data per hypervisor. And so given the trends, you know, you can put tens of virtual machines on a single hypervisor and uh, they in turn all share this um, single host site flash based memory cache. Um, and you know, this is not a fantasy. In fact, there's products, uh, you know, we announced uh, a flash Axler product back in uh, August 2012 that does that. There's uh, companies like Fusion IO that have uh, a quick a crack company called the IO Turbine that exactly do that, provide caching for virtual machines running in this environment. And so let's actually look what really happens in those centers. Well, virtual machines migrate across different um, hosts or servers or, or hypervisors. Um, and what happens is because there's imbalance, there's introduction of new machines, workload changes, et cetera. But what happens is when a virtual machine that was happily using the host side flash, and it's there for two, primarily two reasons. One of them, to offload the backend shared storage that can be overloaded, and two, to reduce latency by actually going to a local cache, a local flash memory, rather than going across the wire to some potential a disk at the other side of the wire. So when that happens, the virtual machine moves, well, it has to somehow bring with it up to the terabyte of data to the different hypervisor. Well, so it takes time. It takes up to 12 hours, as we studied in uh, some of the studies previously published, to actually get back to steady state cache hit rate. So really, what we are after is we want to increase the effective hit rate of these caches by looking, is there a commonality amongst those virtual machines that could potentially use one copy of the data rather than caching their own data and then see how much we get for that in return and how much more effective that host site cache is. So, you know, particularly what we target with this work is a virtual desktop infrastructure. So basically a large number of virtual machines that run desktops, if you will. And um, it turns out that, as you know, it's very many machines on a single, mach on a single hypervisor, but they do all the, all the same, same kind of work. So let's look what happens in those, in those instances. And so we ran some traces. We um, collected data from different workloads in these VDI environments. And you know, I'm not going to read all the labels and tell you all the bar, uh, what all the bars mean, but at a high level, each bar is a different workload. Um, and so, for example, we have something called update storm. Imagine on the leftmost the set of bars, we have a update storm where we push out a new service pack. So we have to write out lots of data. And if you do it across three virtual machines on a single hypervisor, that's what happens. There is some um, sort of commonality. And the way we express it on the y-axis is basically looking for the average number of copies of the same block. So you would expect in the writing where you write the same, um, uh, same block of new ser service pack or patch, around the same time, you actually don't get all the way to sort of, you know, where you want to be, but you're pretty close. And the other workloads are kind of what we call boot storms when what happens when after you have installed new service packs in the Windows world, you typically have to reboot. So what happens when all these hundreds or tens of machines on a single hypervisor reboot at the same time, how much can we alleviate and how much can we share um, by single instance in the content? And then there's things like boot and login storms and stuff like that. So anyway, come to the poster, we have more data. This is sort of kind of to, you know, give you a preview of what we have looked at. But really, what matters is, you know, there's no such thing as free lunch. Great, we can share uh, content, but as we all know, and some of us who built um, cache system, uh, caches, basically, there's a trade-off between single instancing a, a block that is physically or logically 
belonging to many different virtual machines, and basically keeping track of where that single copy, that single instance of that 4K buffer belongs to. So th there's a structure called uh, a cache buffer header, and so normally there's all kinds of sort of internal uh, bit, bit strings and LRU queues, stuff like that, that links all them together or free, free list uh, queues. But in that environment, we also need to put some extra metadata. So really there's a trade-off is how much do we save by single instancing the 4K buffer and how much overhead do we introduce by effectively making the metadata footprint larger, right? So that's really what it is after. And as you all know, distributions are messy. You know, we, we actually observe in, in, in these that those are heavy tailed. There's very few blocks that are that are very many copies of those and there are a large number of blocks that have only a single copy. So how do we actually make the trade off and how do we redesign the host side caches to be effective? That's kind of the ongoing work and that's why we're presenting it here. So with that, uh, thank you very much. Again, I will get the poster and uh, if you have any questions, I'm open for business here for two minutes or so. <laughs> and yes, Joe, we, we do plan to make those traces available at some point. So Good. You, that so, actually so you, was, was my question. So, so, that my so it, one it's, was, it's not there yet, but we'll get there. All right. Have you, you're you're uh, in touch with uh, Jeff then? Uh, Jeff, which Jeff? Yeah, um, at uh, Harvey Mudd. Uh, uh, Jeff Koenig, yes. Yes. Uh, so Correct. Definitely. Thank right. you very much. Yeah. Thank you very much. So, uh, almost done. Second to last speaker here is uh, Preeti Gupta from uh, UC Santa Cruz. Uh, and this is about reverse deduplication, which as a storage vendor I think is the most wonderful thing ever. We're going to unduplicate, undeduplicate your data. We're going to make lots of extra copies. Uh, you have to buy all sorts of new arrays. No, it's about restoring your backups. There was a full talk about this, and hopefully the uh, WIP will also be just as interesting. So. Hello, everyone. So I am Preeti from UCSC, and I'm going to talk about reverse deduplication. Uh, it's a deduplication methodology designed to improve the most recent backup retrieval operation. So let's talk about the problem statement here. So deduplication has been a very popular topic in industry because of potentially large reduction in cost and increase in efficiency. However, as we get more backups, system gets more fragmented. Since in traditional deduplication, we store only the unique chunks, and to retrieve the whole backup, more disk seeks are required because of the fragmentation. So as you see in the picture, the first backup had A, B, C, D, E, F, while for the second backup, since A, C, E were already there, so we stored only K, L, M. So there is a fragmentation, and with the third backup, it's more, because we have more shared chunks. So let's uh, look at the file fragmentation here. So fragmentation is inevitable for both deduplicated and non-deduplicated systems, and it affects retrieval performance to a great extent. Here we are showing the data on actual fragmentation present in a backup system. The data set used here is Linux data set. It's 20 GB data set consisting of uh, 450 versions. So I mean, as we see in the picture, in the graph, almost 30% of the files are fragmented. Again, high fragmentation causes more disk seeks, making retrieval operations slow. So what we are proposing is we are proposing reverse deduplication. I mean, in case of traditional deduplication, you, we store the first backup that has unique chunks completely, and later we store only the delta. With reverse deduplication, we'll store the last backup completely, and we'll claim the chunks from the older backups. So the whole, uh, the last backup will be, you know, stored in its entirety. So if you require the last backup, that's going to be faster. So again, to rephrase the same thing, each new segment will be written contiguously here. Duplicate chunks within latest backup will be stored. So we are not claiming the duplicate chunks that, that are within the backup, within the most recent backup. And duplicate chunks will be claimed from the older backups, replaced by a pointer. And most recent backup is deduplicated when the next backup comes in. So this is making sure that the last backup is complete, but the older ones are deduplicated, so that we do not take up uh, too much of storage space. So we are leveraging the benefit of sequential read over random reads here. 
So the this is the picture showing the algorithm. Uh, so the first backup A, B, C is contiguous, but then when the second backup comes in, it has A and B duplicate with the older backup as well as within the backup. We do not claim those chunks, but we claim the chunks from the first backup. And in case of the third backup, uh, same thing happens. We do not deduplicate any chunks within the backup, but we deduplicate with the older older backups. So uh, what we are achieving here is we are, uh, I mean, with this approach, we uh, it requires less disk seeks to retrieve the most recent backup. That's the most common operation with the backup systems. And it eliminates fragmentation from the most recent backup. And the conclusion here is reverse deduplication is designed for retrieval of most recent backups. We know fragmentation is existing in backup systems and it degrades the performance of retrieval operations. And traditional deduplication stays saves on storage space because we are not storing the whole backups, but we pay a penalty on retrieval operations. Reverse deduplication is an explicit trade-off between storage space and retrieving uh, older backups versus newer backups. And our preliminary uh, results showed four to 19 per, uh, times uh, faster performance uh, while retrieving uh, re uh, most recent backups. Yeah, that's it. Uh, we, we've heard a, a couple of questions over this way. Yeah. Heard a couple of quest of, of uh, papers already at this conference about uh, effectively things that, that involve garbage collection in deduplicating systems, and I'm curious if you can say something about the cost of garbage collecting the holes that you introduce when you uh, remove the duplicates from the older versions. Yes, definitely. I mean, uh, as we with this approach, there will be holes in the older backup systems, and we need to defragment them. This is an explicit trade-off between uh, you know the old. Older backups are will develop more and more holes, anyways, over the time. So I mean, it's it's you know it it's a special requirement if you want to uh, optimize the last backup retrieval op operation. So this is specially for that. Mark Lubridge, HP Labs. So you say there's a trade-off. Do you have any preliminary results for how much the cost is yet in terms of the space consumed? He was asking about the cost of doing the moving. I just wondering how much the space is. I mean, uh, I do not have that in the presentation, but we have that data, and I can you know share with you during the course. Thank you. So I'm going to again ask a question because I was actually very interested to know. Um, so you're going to be able to restore the second to last backup blazingly fast. What about are the what about the second to last, third yes. to last, fourth yes. to last? It, it, it's going to be slow. Have, do you have any measurements whatsoever? I have measurements, but not in the in this because we, this is work in progress. But we are doing those experiments, and it is going to be slower as you move backwards, you know, and and it's going to be faster as you move towards the most recent one. Uh, do you have any idea how it compares necessarily to say traditional systems where you know it's just you get the restore speed? It you will do. be it will be uh, worse than traditional, you know, if you move really far. Okay. All right, well, thank you very much. Thank you. So uh, we're coming up to our last speaker here. Um, our last speaker, Bavaro. Ah. So anyway, it's uh, Alvaro. I practice this, I swear I did. Alvaro Ricuro from the Instituto Superior Tecnico, which is the Technical University in Lisbon. Thank you. Uh, so, um, okay, now I need to hook up. Yeah. Your name. Let's see. Does it want to go in? Okay. There's not much light here. Nope, still, still missing the uh, slides. Still missing the slides. Uh, 
So anyway, if, if anybody had any questions that they didn't get to ask uh, any of the previous presenters, uh, or if you think of something later, uh, all of the whips, again, I'm gonna reiterate, they're gonna be at the poster session tonight, so please do come. Um, I you know people came here in order to uh, get feedback about their work, uh, and so we really would, uh, uh, we're being rescued, it looks like. <laughs> I know nothing about Macintoshes. I'm useless. I can just stand here helplessly. So, thank you very much for our. Thank you, Joseph. Okay. All right. Yep. All right. Lovely. Okay, let's see. Okay, so, hello, everyone. Um, sorry for the technical issue. Um, I think I'm quite new to Mac as well. So, pretty. Pretty interesting. Um, okay, so today we are going to talk basically about um, uh, replication in distributed systems. This is a partial work I'm doing with the lab in Lisbon and uh, our uh, dear professor Luis Vega. And uh, we are talking mainly about here uh, geo replicated systems. And in particular, we are targeting HBase, uh, a big data NoSQL engine, as you, some of you might know. And the, the main motivation for this is, is a framework um, they develop already at INESCID, the, the lab, which is um, based on, on three, three in, in a vector consistency model we will talk about basically in a few seconds. So why would you want your users to, to have a QOD in a system as say HBase, for example? Um, let's say that Facebook wants to, to, to make a business case of their, of their application, that will be helpful then if we have different levels in our um, quality of um, data or quality of service. And we can actually um, replicate those based on our uh, custom uh, QOD to, to the end users. So currently what HBase does is to use eventual consistency for that. So between data centers and remote locations, you, what you have is an asynchronous um, um, type of um, uh, replication, and obviously that, that is on a best effort basis, but you don't have really that, that strong guarantees of, of delivery. It will get there eventually, but you don't really know when. So what we do is uh, we propose to, to have those updates monitor, and when they come in into the system, we introduce our um, QOD. Uh, we have a customized data structure for that. And we are able to, to say, in terms of time sequence and value, um, what are the, the, the important things we want to, to replicate and when? What are the things that are more uh, important to us? Let's say a user has a number of outstanding uh, updates on a row, and that row is, is QOD1, so you want to give that priority. For instance, that will be a sequence in, in this uh, vector consistency model. And probably that will evolve over, over time in chain replication, trying to make that stronger and providing guarantees as well. Uh, and, and also on top, we will probably look at something like session guarantees to, to try to, to develop this, this idea. And, and as, you, as you can imagine, it's, it's, it's expensive to provide consistency. So what we aim at the end of, of this to, to achieve is to, to have a working system, to commit to the, to the main development trunk of HBase and, and see if we can actually uh, make this interesting to someone in the community or someone even in Facebook, why not? Uh, currently, you don't have anything like that on Facebook, right? You just 
uh, all messages are being treated in the same fashion. So uh, that's pretty much it. We are having three different cluster locations set, set up for these uh, experiments. And we are going to use uh, Yahoo YCSB, Yahoo Cloud Service Benchmark, for evaluating our, our, our data, our results. And you are all invited, please, to come to the poster session to, to have a look to our poster and ask as many questions as you, as you want. And um, I look forward to, yeah, to come back next year maybe with a full paper on, on that or similar topic. That's, that's all I have to tell you. And please ask any questions you might have. Thank you. So you're afraid of Spaniard, yeah? <laughs> oh, come on, it's not, it's not scary. He's not scary at all. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, I think it's an interesting topic. We, we didn't think about this um, really in terms of Facebook and so on, but actually we started to realize that uh, why, why wouldn't you want to, to have that on top of something like HBase? Um, Facebook probably is not caring about that in the sense that they don't have to deliver that. Uh, SLA to their end users, but if you made a business case of this, probably it will be really interesting to be able to know, to say to the, to the users, okay, you're going to have this level of um, consistency of data, you're going to have that other level, and that will be, I guess, something, I don't know if very novel, but quite new at so the moment. Have you thought about what sort of measures to use for consistency overall and, and the various theoretical, you know, like yeah. there's uh, maybe you're K-regular or, you know, safe or whatever. Um. Yeah, um, as I said, we are going to look at this uh, QOD um, with some vector, uh, consistency vector with time, sequence, and value. So the, the, um, the policy, the, um, the way of um, evaluating this will be probably, um, first of all, comparing with the existing framework they have in place, which ha um, has provided um, uh, meaningful information and actually it shows that there are savings on the bandwidth usage and latency and so on and and also try to um, yeah to, to see um, according to each of these cons constraints how can we uh, actually order updates and replicate updates and and probably batch updates and and then just try to compare with uh, the core architecture of HBase and the existing framework, and this work is based on, and now this, which is inside of the core architecture of HBase itself. Okay. I don't know if that answers. I think we can certainly talk more at the poster. Yeah. All right. Uh, thank you very, thank very much. much. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone.